The Dalai Lama. It is now nearly 20 years since the first Mind and Life conference took place in Dharamsala. Some of those who fostered and encouraged those initial dialogues between Buddhism and modern science, such as the late Robert Livingston and Francisco Varela, are no longer with us. Nevertheless, I'm sure they would share the pride and enthusiasm the eminent scientists, contemplatives, and other contributors who have subsequently been involved have expressed about what our conversations have achieved so far. Although modern science and the Buddhist contemplative tradition arose out of quite different historical, cultural, and intellectual circumstances, I have found that they have a great deal in common. By some accounts, both traditions are motivated by an urge to relieve the hardships of life. Both are suspicious of notions of absolutes, whether these imply the existence of a transcendent creator or an unchanging entity such as a soul, preferring to account for the emergence of life in the world in terms of the natural laws of cause and effect. Both traditions take an empirical approach to knowledge. It is a fundamental Buddhist principle that the human mind has tremendous potential for transformation. Science, on the other hand, has, until recently, held to the convention not only that the brain is the seat and source of the mind, but also that the brain and its structures are formed during infancy and change little thereafter. Buddhist practitioners familiar with the workings of the mind have long been aware that it can be transformed through training. What is exciting and new is that scientists have now shown that such mental training can also change the brain. Related to this is evidence that the brain adapts or expands in response to repeated patterns of activity, so that in a real sense, the brain we develop reflects the life we lead. This has far-reaching implications for the effects of habitual behavior in our lives, especially the positive potential of discipline and spiritual practice. Evidence that powerful sections of the brain, such as the visual cortex, can adapt their function in response to circumstances reveals an astonishing malleability unforeseen by earlier, more mechanistic interpretations of the brain's workings. Findings that show how a mother's expressions of love and physical contact with her child can affect the triggering of different genetic responses tell us a great deal about the importance we need to give to bringing up our children if we wish to create a healthy society. On the other hand, it is also tremendously encouraging to know that some therapeutic techniques may successfully be employed to help those people who, due to childhood neglect, find it difficult to generate warm, compassionate feelings toward others. Reports of cases where normal function has been restored through therapy indicate exciting and innovative discoveries. Finally, there has been a positive answer to the question I have been asking for many years. Investigators have shown that how people think really can change their brains.